Greetings, friends and brethren. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Continuing Church of God. Today I want to talk about somebody that most people probably never heard of, but actually the Greco-Roman Protestant world's actually been very influenced by him. And this is a man who's known as Gregory the Wonder Worker. Also, in the Greek, is known as uh, Gregory Thaumaturgus. And I want to read a little bit from a Roman Catholic source about him. This is from Catholic Online. Gregory was of a distinguished pagan family. He was born in Neo Caesarea Pontus and studied law there. About 233 AD, he and his brother, Athenodorus, accompanied his sister, who was joining her husband in Caesarea, Palestine, where they continued to go to Beirut to continue their law studies. They met Origen. Now, this is Origen of Alexandria. And instead of going to Beirut, they went to his school at Caesarea. He studied theology, and he was converted to Christianity, supposedly, by Origen. He became one of his disciples. And it was soon became apparent that he was gifted with remarkable powers. So we've got somebody who supposedly has remarkable powers. Now, before going into some of those powers and what he ended up doing, I'd like to explain a few things, some prophecies from the Bible warning about something. If you've got a Bible, you might want to follow along. I'm going to go to Isaiah chapter 47, and I'm going to uh, start a little bit in verse 1. This is a warning. Isaiah 47, verse 1. Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. So this is a prophecy of somebody who's called a virgin, but it's talking about the daughter of Babylon. This is an ancient Babylon. This is actually a reference to mystery Babylon, which we read about in the book of Revelation, chapter 17. Now, in verse 5, we see that this lady, this woman, is called the lady of the kingdoms, which interestingly is a word or term that some apparitions of Mary have used or been called, or Mary, uh, the Catholic version of Mary sometimes has been called the, uh, the Lady of the Kingdoms. Now, let's go down to verse 7. See what this, some of these things this lady says. And you said, I shall be a lady forever, so that you not take these things to heart, nor remember the latter end of them. Therefore, hear this now, you who are given the pleasures, you who dwell securely, who say in your heart, I am, and there's no one else besides me. I shall not sit like a widow, nor shall I know the loss of children. Verse 9. But these two things shall come up to you in a moment, in one day, the loss of children and widowhood. They shall come upon you in their fullness because of the multitude of your sorceries for the great abundance of your enchantments. For you've trusted in your wickedness, and you said to me, No one sees me. Your wisdom and your knowledge have warped you. And you said in your heart, I am, and there is none else besides me. Therefore, evil shall come upon you. You shall not know where it arises, and trouble shall fall upon you. You will not be able to put it off, and desolation will come upon you suddenly, which you shall not know. Now we see that this person is talking about sorceries and enchantments. Now if you look in the New Testament, we can find out about a time where somebody who was involved with Christianity had to do with sorcery. This is in the book of Acts. We're going to go to the book of Acts chapter 8. And we're going to just go down to verse 9 here. And we says there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and he astonished the people of Samaria claiming he was somebody great. As we see, people gave heed to them. They thought he was a great one. He actually became baptized by one of the apostles, Philip, either the apostle or the evangelist Philip. So you'd think he'd be a Christian, but no, he wasn't. He saw that the, uh, when his disciples laid, put hands on people, down in verse 17, they received the Holy Spirit. And now Simon sees this. So in verse 18, we see that when he put his hands on there to, to get the Holy Spirit, he offered them money to get this. And Peter said to him, no, your money perished because of this. You, you don't have it right. You're bitter. You're the wrong type of person. Well, we find out later throughout history, according to uh, Irenaeus, he wrote that Simon ended up uh, working with a prostitute called Helena, who he said was the mother of all. And then he got people to worship both him and Helena. 
And so we see something beginning back then. Now the Apostle Paul warned about something back then, and I'm going to tie this in with Gregory Thermagogus and Thermaturgus in just a moment here. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting in verse uh, 9. So the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they have not received the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they may all be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, why do I mention any of this? So we see that the Apostle Paul said, starting from his time, there were people involved with signs and lying wonders and lawlessness. And we saw the warning in Isaiah about this type of thing. Now, around 238 to 244, Gregory of Neocesarea, again known as Gregory Thaumaturgus, he actually claimed to see an apparition of Mary. Now, some people think he's not the first one, but actually that the first one had to do with something called the Proto-Evangelicum of James. But other Catholic scholars say, no, he's the first one to supposedly see an apparition that claimed to be Mary from Jesus' mother. Now, this wasn't truly Jesus' mother Mary. Let me read something that uh, Robertson Donaldson reported about this Gregory, the Wonder Worker. Quote, He was believed to be gifted with the power of working miracles which he was exceedingly exercising. Now, if you hear about miracles, oh, this sounds like he's probably a good guy. But notice this. The demons were subject to him. He could cast his cloak over a man and cause his death. Now, this is not a Christian man. This is not a pastor of God going around taking his cloak and throwing it on people to get them to die. But Gregory did this. Furthermore, he could bring the presiding demons back to their shrine. His power over demons and other wonders apparently were accepted by many. And he had a lot of influence. Basically because of his influence as well as imperial persecutions, he basically drove the Church of God in Asia Minor into, uh, into uh, semi-exile. And from that time, from his time forward, the true church was no longer dominant in the area of Asia Minor, which is where he was from. Now, I'm going to hold up this book for a moment. We have a booklet called The Continuing History of the Church of God, which you can find at the www.ccog.org website. That's www.ccog.org website. Go to books and booklets so that you can find this, because you're going to find a lot of things about church history that a lot of people do not know or do not understand. Now... Gregory was a factor in the Marian cults that rose up. They started to rise up because around his time. He wanted excessive devotion to what he called the Holy Virgin. And he included blasphemously teaching that Mary blotted out Eve's transgressions. He was probably the earliest one, if not one of the earliest ones, if not the earliest one, to actually use the expression Holy Trinity. And while people think, well, that was good because a lot of Trinitarians believe that, actually, there were almost no Trinitarians in the third century, which is the time of Gregory. It took a while. Now, into the early fourth century, probably only 10%, at the most 15% of the Greco-Roman bishops actually were Trinitarian up to that point. And it was said that Gregory said, the, here's the mystery of the Holy Trinity was revealed by the archangel to the Holy Virgin according to the gospel. So Gregory is claiming that the Trinity came from an archangel to Mary to him. He also said that the, what was, uh, the soul is simple. What is simple is immortal. Well, up until that time, most of the Greco-Romans didn't believe in the immortality of the soul. It was considered to be a pagan concept. But they got this from Gregory the Wonder Worker. Now in 1 Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 1, we see a warning from the Apostle Paul. 1 Timothy 4, starting in verse 1. 
Now the Spirit expressly says in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. And Gregory was one who had contact with demons. Now, according to the Catholic Encyclopedia, Gregory the Wonder Worker was the first one who developed a creed that actually had the term Trinity in it. Now, what's interesting about this, to me at least, according to the Catholic Encyclopedia, here's a quote after they talked about his creed, quote, it is manifest that a dogma so mysterious presupposes a divine revelation. Now, so the Catholic Encyclopedia is actually saying is that the Trinity didn't really come from this book, the Bible here, but it came from a divine revelation, essentially through a demonic apparition through Gregory the Wonder Worker, and that's where they ended up getting this originally. So I'd like to go to uh, uh, 2 John chapter 7. Now one of the things that Gregory said in his uh, creed is that the Father has never been not without the Son, nor the Son without the Spirit, and the same Trinity is immutable and unalterable forever. Well, if the Father was never without the Son, then Jesus never died for us. Because if Jesus uh, truly died, the Father and the Son would have been separated for that period of time. But no, Gregory taught the opposite of that. And this is why I told you to go to, or ask you to go to 2 John chapter 7, start, excuse me, 2 John verse 7, starting verse 7. For many deceivers have gone out in the world and did not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we work for, but we receive our full reward. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrines of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house nor greet him. For he who greets him shares his evil deeds. Well, people should stay away from Gregory's deceptive doctrine of Antichrist. As far as the Trinity goes, by the way, the first two people who supposedly brought it, who attempted to bring it into the Greco-Roman world were uh, Valentinus, who came from Egypt, and Montanus, who came from Pontus, and both of them were denounced by Church of God leaders such as Polycarp of Smyrna, Serapion of Antioch, and, and others denounced the people who brought in the, the Trinity. And interestingly, even the Church of Rome finally, after putting up with them for decades, put out Marci excuse me, Montanus and uh, Valentinus in the, as, as heretics. Now, Gregory, the wonder worker, also wrote this related to, Mary, to his ver version of Mary. O holy virgin, she's the ever-blooming paradise of incorruptibility, wherein is planted the tree that gives life, that furnishes all fruits of immortality. The holy virgin, while still in the flesh, maintained the incorruptible life. The holy virgin has surpassed even the perfection of the patriarchs. But we should go to the book of Hebrews because we do not find the Bible teaching that Mary was perfect and without sin. But Gregory the Wonder Worker basically laid the foundation for this. Hebrews 4, starting in verse 14, we see, seeing that we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to this throne of grace, that we may attain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Now we're supposed to go to Jesus. The Bible doesn't say to go to Mary in our time of need. In the book of Romans, chapter 3, verse 23, you don't have to go there, but it says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And that means that Mary is not superior to other Christians. Stating or implying otherwise is in biblical error. And by the way, if you happen to be Roman Catholic and you're watching this, let me read something from the Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma. Quote, The doctrine of the Immaculate Conception of Mary is not explicitly revealed in Scripture. Neither the Greek nor Latin fathers explicitly teach the Immaculate Conception of Mary. But it basically developed from Gregory the Wonder Worker. Now, here's something else he wrote. 
all who worthily observe the festival, the Annunciation of the Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, acquire as their meat or their reward, recompense the fully interested message. Hail, you who are highly favored. Let's keep your feast with psalms, with hymns and spiritual songs. Israel kept their festival, but it was with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. But the prophet says he's going to turn those fleece into affliction and lamentation. But our afflictions, the Lord has assured us, he'll return into joy by the fruits of penitence. What this means is, Gregory was saying, don't keep the biblical holy days. Instead, keep a holiday to Mary. And Gregory was influential in getting the Church of Rome in order to do that. Now, here's something the Catholic Encyclopedia wrote about him. Gregory of Neo Caesarea holds a very prominent place to attract people to the festivals and honors of the martyrs. We learn that Gregory organized profane amusements as an attraction for the pagans who could not understand a ceremony without some pleasures of a less serious nature. So basically what they're saying is in the third century, Gregory came up with feasts for pagans that they'd like so they'd become part of their church. And it's not just in the Catholic Encyclopedia you get this. We get this. Their Cardinal John Henry Newman in the late 19th century wrote that to use the very appendages of demon worship for evangelical use, the rulers of the church from the earliest times did this. And then who's he start off with? St. Gregory Thaumaturgus supplies us the first instance of this economy. And he goes through this in more detail. Basically, that Gregory was the one that said, hey, let's use paganism to get people to become part of our church. And then says that uh, Emperor Constantine followed up with this. And by the way, that's where we ended up getting Christmas, was because that was the birthday of the, god, the sun god Mithra, which was worshipped by Emperor Constantine. But this all started with Gregory, uh, the, the wonder worker. Again, a lot of people do not understand church history or where their doctrine comes from. Now, you say, okay, you read some prophecies, so what? Well, let's look in the book of Revelation. I want to read a couple of things there. Revelation chapter 18. Remember, I was reading some prophecies from Isaiah 47 from the Old Testament. I want to tie these in a little bit with the New Testament. In Revelation 17, we, verse 5, we read about mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. But we go to Revelation 18. I want to read starting in verse uh, 7 here. In the measure that she glorified herself, she lived luxuriously. In the same measure, give her torment and sorrow. This again is tying to what we read about in Isaiah 47. For she says in her heart, I say as a queen, I am no widow, and I see no sorrow. Therefore her plagues will come to her in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she'll be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord who judges her. Again, this ties in with the prophecy in Isaiah 47. There are prophecies that sorceries would be used to deceive people, and people would be deceived. And in terms of uh, sorceries, we can also go down to verse uh, 23 of of. Revelation 18 it says, The light of a lamp shall not shine in you, to talk about mystery Babylon anymore, and the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall not be heard in you anymore. For your merchants were the great men of the earth, for by your sorcery all the nations were deceived. And these are sorceries that were warned about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that people are going to fall for signs and lying wonders. Now as Christians, as the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5-7, we're supposed to walk by faith, not by sight. But Paul was warning us in 2 Thessalonians that most would be deceived in the end times because of signs and lying wonders. And we've seen throughout church history with Simon Magus and Gregory the Wonder Worker that these types of signs and lying wonders have been used. Now, growing up Roman Catholic, I thought one of the reasons that Roman Catholics were really into Catholicism was church history. Then I read, started to look into church history and found, oh, it doesn't teach it the way they thought. But later, I found out, actually, 
apparitions of Mary and various other signs and wonders that are actually a big reason that people have become or stay part of that church. And in the end times, I believe the Bible, well, the Bible says there will be more signs and lying wonders, and we may very well see some type of Marian apparitions. And one of the people who set the stage for this is an, un, an unknown person. He changed doctrine. He got paganism more widely accepted within the Church of Rome and actually set the, up the foundation for them to accept the Trinity. And he's somebody, again, most people have not heard about. He's called Gregory the Wonder Worker. Again, if you want to learn more about church history, believe what the Bible says, but also check out our free book, Continuing History of the Church of God. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Continuing Church of God.